Yeah, so I mean, as we said, you know, I'm local here from the Denver area, and I just want to put out a huge thank you to the DevOps Days organizing team. Uh, this group of leaders in this community has been invaluable to my growth and the pivot that I've made on my path in engineering and culture. Uh, huge shout out. Why don't we put our hands together for them? Yeah. They put an amazing event together here. So it was like. Uh, I like to snowboard, and that is a picture of my dog. His name is Pepsi, and he's a very good boy. Um, I contribute to Kubernetes in my free time, and then also I'm very happy to give my employer Beatport a shout out because they support my contributions in the open source community. Uh, right now at Beatport, we're doing things with GKE, and we need Python developers to create new products that are going to reinvent the world for DJing. So um, if you are interested in building real-time systems and encoding systems that could potentially be native to Kubernetes, uh, we're doing build-outs in our data centers and doing continuous deployment multiple times a day uh, into the cloud. So we're hiring. You know, reach out to me. And um, other thank yous, just really quick before I get going. A uh, special shout out to Joe Thompson, who's maybe in this room, and then also Seth Goings uh, from the Microsoft team for giving me resources to become authoritative in this topic. Uh, other people also directly involved uh, in helping me with feedback and conversations related to this talk. Chris Nova, AJ Bowen, Gareth Rushgrove, those kinds of peeps. Uh, reach out to your community members for sure if you are uh, looking for feedback and want to get growing. So engineering with the growth mindset. Like what makes a good engineer or a good hacker? There's something kind of uh, beautiful. Oh, do we have a clicker? Shoot. No, that's fine. I'll just go up here. So what makes like a good hack? A beautiful hack is something that's kind of like thrown together. It's, it's put together with resources, questionable knowledge, and understanding of a problem. Uh, my friend, Fernand Guyana, a couple years ago, uh, he put this Raspberry Pi cluster together. It's running Kubernetes. It's powered off of a USB battery pack. Its internet connection comes from a 4G LTE modem that's right there, uh, hooked up into a switch that's doing bonding. The second tower over on the right is another pair of Raspberry Pis that are also part of the Kubernetes cluster. They are hooked up to several Internet of Things sensors that power, uh, you know, capabilities like being able to trip a laser or being able to determine the decibel level of a room, being able to control LEDs on that strip right there at the bottom. And what he has actually is an Elixir application running on this cluster that's talking to a bus, and then over GPIO, uh, execing into privileged Docker containers that interact with the Internet of Things devices. The Elixir application has a front end that is ngrok out to the internet over LTE. And basically, one of the coolest parts of this demo was that you could go to a website on your phone, he would boot up the cluster, and then you could like tap on the phone, colors would pop up on your phone, and then they would like pop up on the LED strip. It was like the craziest thing. And Fernand gave this demo about all of the different components that he had put together to get this Internet of Things kind of like smart home cluster set up. And every like 30 minutes, he blew my mind with something that was completely pushing the boundaries of what I thought was possible or even useful in terms of containerization and web technologies and our mobile world. And so it's like, what does Fernand do that differentiates him from somebody who's maybe relatively underaccomplished in their engineering pursuits? And a lot of the work that I'm going to be talking about today is based on this PhD psychology professor out of Stanford University. Her name is Carol Dweck. And she talks about the difference between a growth mindset and a fixed mindset. I think that Fernand is an incredibly hungry engineer who loves to apply fun problem-solving techniques to technologies that are not commonly used in order to produce amazing demonstrations of useful applications for where we're going with in our world. And so what's the difference between like a growth and a fixed mindset? And we have a couple statements here. You may or may not resonate with some of them. 
right? So A, your intelligence is something very basic about you that you can't really change. You agree with that. What about B? You can learn new things, but you can't really change how intelligent you are at a basic level. See, no matter how much intelligence you have, you can always change it a little bit. Or D, you can always substantially change how intelligent you are. These are decisions that you make. And so this demonstrates a mindset of growth versus a mindset of fixed being in relation to intelligence. And I mean, this might feel a little bit absurd to you because you know we're all here at this conference and we're ready to grow. We're all incredibly smart people, you know, and we've done a lot of work to get there. So maybe here's a more helpful illustration of how mindset can really affect your ability to go in a particular direction with your growth. Physical fitness. Is physical fitness something that's just like very basic about somebody that you can't really change? Or maybe on the other side with D, so C and D are the growth mindset statements. No matter how physically fit you are, you can always change it quite a bit. That contrasts almost like complete opposite to B, which is you can become healthier, but you can't really change how physically fit you are. Right? And so this demonstrates that we can have different mindsets in relation to our own beings and the beings of others in different categories of our capability. So what are we measuring then? What does it mean to grow? Right? You might look at the product that you get out of a growth event as an increased capability, increased volume and maybe customer base. You know, more requests per second hitting your purchase button. An emotional response maybe to a talk or a presentation that you give to your team. Maybe a rally cry after an incident. How much impact are you having as a leader? You know, how quickly can you respond to an incident? Mean time to recovery, mean time between failures. We had a great talk about that. Let's talk about capability. This is a good way to measure what we can do, right? So a capability is created when a suitable actor or set of actors combined with a vectoring support structure, so something that is capable to like transfer that actual action, the knowledge that somebody might have you know, into an actual event, when those things cooperate to create a change. And so somebody who can lift 300 pounds their mindset is there. They know that they've practiced over and over again before, and so they are a suitable actor. And they also got the guns to lift the barbell up, you know, that nine inches that's necessary. And, uh, a chef knows that a knife is very crucial to their ability to prepare food. A sharp knife, you know, Gordon Ramsay says a sharp knife is accurate. It allows you to make precise cuts quickly, efficiently, you know? Whereas like a dull knife, it's like, now you got Gordon screaming, you can't tell the difference between the tomato and the blood. You know, it's an accident waiting to happen, right? And I actually want to demonstrate the difference between a dull tool and a sharp tool in our industry, you know? So, uh, this is kind of hard, let's see. here. That makes sense. All right. There we go. SSH. How many people have SSH into a server? How many people SSH into a server today? Yeah, right? I'm going to SSH into a server. Let's go to BP Happy One. All right. This is one of our web servers over in our uh, that's red because it's my production environment, another example of the capability that I expect from my shell. But uh, so like, hey, maybe I want to see, you know, what volumes are here, right? So I would type sudo. Notice I've like had to get an interactive shell on the server. You know, oh, okay, well, this thing's got a single disk and a swap area. And then what about like, I think it's in user local lsp min lb toggle status. 
Oh, I got a pseudo that. This machine's in the load, so it's receiving customer traffic. Okay, well that's an example of like answering a very simple question. I've had a query as an engineer, and now I'm wondering, hey, like is this machine traffic? This is something that I would probably do in a debugging scenario. Right. Did you know that Ansible is actually like a really good parallel SSH tool? You see, for some people this might be obvious, but so many years of my career, I as an engineer had to spend time then hitting the up button, popping over, pressing two here, and then going in and then typing sudo. And this is something that you've probably seen your colleagues do as well when they want the answer to a question. And then they might like get all elaborate about it and then like open up new terminals and all of this business and like you feel like you're in some kind of episode of Silicon Valley because it's definitely a joke, your workflow. You've got like a spreadsheet to track like what's in load and what isn't. I mean, we've all done this. Well, what if you were able to, as root, kind of become and run a command on all of the happy nodes and then local sbin lb toggle status. And assuming that I'm connected, so the machine's in the load, right? And now you've got a bunch of them that are returning answers back to you. And this is an example of a tool that's not as dull as a normal serial SSH process. You know, Puppet might even say that this is a bad example of SSH in a for loop. <laughs> but um, point being that the capability of our tools is very, very important. And when you use a sharp knife, you're able to make more precise decisions. This makes you a more capable individual. So in our careers, we are looking for what are the opportunities to create better tools so that we can take these human decisions and translate them into accurate and more error-free kind of actions. And, um, when we create capabilities, we have the chance to transform our habits. See, habits influence decision. Decision produces action. So like in that scenario right there, I want to know like across all of these web servers, you know, which ones are in load so that perhaps I can figure out which ones to not look at blogs for in Kibana or something like that, right? And so then as a product of action, we can start to evaluate what the results are. Our evaluation of results informs our understanding, which now gives us a framework to begin to transform our habits. Our understanding allows us to say, hey, you know, maybe the way that I did it before wasn't the best way and this is a new approach that I can take in the future, right? But ultimately, if you kind of think about the decisions that you make over the course of a day, a lot of them are very low effort. In some ways, you almost have a conditioned response to say, oh, well, that thing is wrong. Well, like, maybe we should go do this. Oh, well, this teammate is unable to do this, and like maybe I should go grab that ticket off of the backlog. And when we start to evaluate our decisions and the products that they create, we can reform a new framework of understanding to refactor our habits so that we change the way that we behave. What does this look like in practice? So, Applying a growth mindset to a particular problem domain. Hey, we're in the Kubernetes track. I get to talk about a cool controller that we use. The external DNS controller is a Kubernetes service that you run inside of your cluster. And basically, you give it permission to look at all of the services and ingress objects in your entire cluster, or maybe in a namespace or whatever. And then it goes and it says like every minute or every 30 seconds, oh, these are your services, these are the ones that are load balancers, they have IP addresses. And if you put an annotation on those services, it will just like automatically make a DNS record for you. And so what that means is that like I can just deploy a service to a cluster, back it with some backend that's like serving traffic or whatever, and then it gets a load balancer from Google Cloud, that load balancer has an IP, and suddenly it's got a human readable name where people can reach to it and resolve to it with our DNS servers. And so the use case here was to like have branch name beatportci.com. 
right? We push to GitHub, then that goes up into Container Builder and deploys to GKE. We have a deployment there managed by Helm, and then it, as a product of making those services that are deployed by Helm, it makes a DNS record in Google Cloud so that as developers, we are able to easily access our environments and debug our code and share it with other people, right? And so I started looking at the documentation. It's actually an alpha project in Kubernetes incubator. And, but I mean, I was looking through, people are having success stories, the documentation looks reasonable. I'm like, I could probably deploy this and get it configured. So I get it up into the cluster and then I apply my load balancer and I start looking at the logs and it's just like over and over again saying, you know, created test one, created test two, created test one, created test two. And I'm like, well, I mean, this is clearly not working. I'm querying DNS and the record's not there. I'm looking in my Google Cloud console and it's not showing up in the zone. And so I start like joining the Slack channel, asking people, hey, have you gotten this working? They're like, oh yeah, totally. And so I suspect, well, there's some kind of issue. Um, it's clearly thinking that it's making DNS records, but nothing's happening. And so I decide to write up an issue, and then of course in the process of writing up an issue, I'm like replacing Beatport with company, you know, in, in my documentation of the state of the world that I'm working in. And then I find this, which is that I have a zone and it's named properly, and that's the name that I use in the configuration for the controller, but then the DNS name says betport.com, right? And so I'm like, well, this makes me feel dumb. The fixed response to this is, oh, well, I've clearly made a typo. I should probably go fix that typo and see if it works. I went and did that. That's great and everything. But wait a minute. The logs say that they're creating the record over and over again. It's like, that's kind of weird. Well, maybe the, the growth response to this is that my tool isn't actually doing its job. Maybe my tool doesn't have the right habits. Well, I mean, how do you teach a computer to have habits? Well, at, at this point, you start to maybe think there's something wrong in the code. I've, I've written, you know, a little bit of Golang before this, and I thought to myself, oh, you know, like, error handling is optional. Maybe I'll just, like, go look in there and, like, maybe somebody didn't, like, put in the DNS error handling, you know, into the logs. And I actually found out that there was some major restructuring that was necessary in order to make this happen. Um, I, it probably took about a day of my life. I started refactoring things. I moved some code around. I learned how to become a Kubernetes contributor. I joined the organization, signed the CLA and all of that stuff. And then I'm like, but this all came from an effort inspired by belief that the tool could be more than it was and that it could do more for me. That I like knew if I can create a DNS record with an easy algorithm in my head, then surely we can teach a computer. And so that inspired this feature set change for refactoring the logging, which also changed the flow control. And while I was in there, um, it was also very easy to implement uh, just plumbing from a particular configuration option of the controller into the provider to add a TTL. Um, for the DNS records, which was uh, also cool. And so what turned from like kind of a horrific de debugging experience because of my habits and my mindset, I thought, hey, you know, I can probably fix that. And it ends up becoming a capability that's distributed into open source. So that's kind of a cool story. And, um, and so kind of want to talk about the process there. This is the just-in-time evaluation of deficiency. The first thing is like, is it me? You know, is my current understanding producing a false assumption? Are my current habits maybe producing suboptimal decisions? You know, this might be like a typo. If you can't type like me, then you know maybe there's going to be problems there. But if you've moved on from you and maybe you're ruling out typing, you know, as kind of a bad reason for something to go wrong, then maybe you can ask yourself, oh, maybe it's the safety of my tools. Like, do my tools allow me to be a capable operator or do they handle a suboptimal scenario? What assumptions are they making and what situations do they put me in maybe as an operator or as a team member that could be potentially improved? 
Is the deficiency there? Well, if it's not the tool's fault, then it must be something outside of the tool. Maybe the environment is just not applicable for the capability that I'm trying to apply. Maybe I've made a false assumption. Maybe there's something missing. And so I think this is a helpful framework to say, you know, if I'm going to grow in an experience of a deficiency, like I should evaluate from myself outwards and then determine at what point I can make the change so that I can create better habits and refine the capability. What about communication with others? Okay, so we've talked about technical tooling and technical decision making, but are like engineers just kind of less socially adept than other people? You know, there's actually a study in phys.org, you can look this up, but they determined that engineering leaders are much more likely to lack a demonstration of empathy that's necessary for people to, you know, emote and collaborate with each other. And some people might take that as an excuse. Oh, you know, like engineering is just kind of a field where people, they, you know, aren't as great at talking with others. You know, or, oh, well, I mean, like my manager, you know, he's kind of just like going through some stuff right now and maybe it's, we'll just like talk some other time. Oh, my teammate, you know, it's maybe he's got different priorities and, uh, you know, we should just table that feature or this part of the backlog. But I don't, you know, the way that I approach things, I can't tell you how to think, but people skills are one of the greatest investments that you can make personally to change your environment, to create new capabilities for you, yourself, your team, your organization, your company, your business, whatever you call it, right? And this extends far beyond the workplace. I mean, people skills are necessary in your personal and romantic relationships. They are what allow you to create new connections, new ideas, and new possibilities with people you don't already know. And in the workplace, we're collaborating all the time these days. The individual contributor is kind of allied. There's not a lot of people coding in a corner anymore, producing magic things that are creating a large impact. Yeah. Let's talk about verbiage for a second. So this is a big improvement point. When we recognize work, when we attribute excellence, when we decide that something is worth noting, I think it's important to recognize the actual work that went into achieving the excellence. What are the decisions? What are the habits? What are the things that we have in play that are allowing us to continue growing to a point of efficiency, success, collaboration. See, attributing excellence, like whether it's intelligence, like, oh, that's, that person is so smart, or wow, that person's just a robot. They produce like so many lines of code, you know. Assessing somebody's intelligence and then attributing their intelligence as a trait that they just are does a disservice to the amount of investment that they've put in in order to get to that end state. And so when you consider, like maybe as a manager, recognizing somebody, maybe you shouldn't say, wow, you're just a genius. You know? Or, wow, you're like really incredible at this. I could never do what you do. Like it's some untouchable thing. You know, if you have a non-technical manager, you may have had that experience before. I have personally. But instead, recognizing the amount of work that goes in to developing the proficiency, like it's, it's respecting reading man proc at 2 a.m. You know, it's respecting like a, a proficiency with said. It's respecting an understanding of the operator pattern or any of these things that you get maybe out of like the big four programming book, right? And so what I want to encourage is that if you are willing to grow in your ability to communicate with others, make sure that you are recognizing them for their merits and all of the work that has gone up to producing that. This actually comes inspired out of a study that Dweck did with a bunch of adolescent teens she administered some IQ tests, nonverbal problems, to a group of students. And group A was conditioned 
for after solving you know, relatively easy problems, 10 of them, they said, wow, like, you're so smart in this area. It seems like, like you're doing a really good job. And then group B said, wow, like you really worked hard on those problems. Administering a second test of increased difficulty, 90% of the students in group B performed higher than in the first examination, whereas we saw a detriment of scores in group A. You can look up this study. Uh, there's also a related, there's also a related uh, portion of that study where students in group A, another control group, they were less likely to want to pursue harder problems when conditioned or placed in a mindset where they had an inherent intelligence. So uh, I want to tell you about Matt Kelly really quick. Matt Kelly is a new contributor to SIG Cluster Lifecycle, which is a, a development group in Kubernetes. And uh, I developed a tool called Vagrant Kubernetes Testing, which is just a vagrant box that makes it easy to compare multiple binaries and builds of Kubernetes. Kelly was, uh, or Matt Kelly was interested in HA clusters with Kubernetes. He works with Containership out of Boston. And he was a complete noob to the code, but I couldn't help but notice that he was incredibly hungry to ramp up and become proficient. And so I invited him to join the SIG calls. He joins. You know? And then I say, oh, well, like, do you want to own this? And then he says, yep, totally. And then he puts in a Kubernetes proposal for config map scheme changes a month later. And that pull request is interesting and is also backed up by a POC. So this is just another growth mindset example of somebody who's coming into a new environment unacquainted with the capabilities that are necessary in order to contribute real change, and then working through reaching out to others to make sure that they could become a contributor. So, and, um, groupthink, this is a symptom of what they call the, what was this? It's culture, culture of genius. So Dweck has research where she explains that organizations can have aggregate mindsets as a result of the way that people think. And groupthink is, tends to be not a good thing in our industry. It's when a bunch of people start thinking the same way, and this is often caused by almost like an, an unquestioned trust of some infallible or genius leader. Uh, Alfred P. Sloan is a great example of how to reverse this kind of group think. He's the former CEO of GM, and he's quoted with postponing the policy decision of some very high-level people in the business to allow for disagreement and understanding to form. You know, basically, they were in a meeting, and he was like, so everybody's ready to go here? Like, we all agree? I thought that was interesting. Uh, there's another great quote about killing your heroes from Alison Kaptur's blog. Uh, some examples of this are things that you might see a lot of times in job postings and culture descriptions. Uh, myths about the 10x engineer or the on-call hero, a team of rock stars. Maybe you've read books about managing delicate geniuses. I, personally, I think this stuff is kind of ridiculous. Uh, these people have done a lot of work to become somebody who can contribute to a level that multiplies capability. And so that's an area where if you catch yourself saying something like this, then you may be in a fixed mindset in relation to people's success. Um, also, trust in a culture of development. So this is the opposite of a culture of genius uh, in an organizational mindset. Uh, people who are in these cultures are more likely to agree with statements like, people are trustworthy in my org. I feel a strong sense of ownership to the future of the company. This company generally supports risk taking and will support me if I fail. This is all stuff from Dweck's studies. People are encouraged to be innovative. You know, creativity is welcomed at this company. And so it's important to reconsider, you know, it's like if you are spreading a culture of genius into your organization, you might be inhibiting statistically based off of this research that you know, you, you might be inhibiting innovation. You might be stifling your ability to change. And so the way that we encourage our engineers and our project managers, the people that we work with, people in the business is very important, so. Uh, lastly, in, in terms of coaching, there's a lot of co coaching that happens in our field. You know, senior engineer to junior engineer, you know, or peer-to-peer -peer manager, 
you know, down into other ranks. Uh, in regards to coaching, are you fixed mindset? Are you concerned foremost about your reputation? You know, do you tolerate mistakes? Do you motivate people through judgment of the results of their actions? This may be holding your team back. Dweck says you know, in an action item in chapter eight of the mindset book that you should maybe try on the growth mindset with your coaching. And so instead of asking for mistake-free exercises, ask for commitment and effort from your team members. And this goes for everybody. I mean, you can have a flat org structure and implement this kind of coaching. So instead of judging others, give them the respect and the coaching that they need to develop, and then recognize when they put in the work in order to achieve those results. So, and, um, so where do we take all of this? You know, are you willing to maybe examine the areas where you could start growing? Are you willing to maybe concede to the fact that if you haven't accomplished something in an area where you need growth, it's not because of an inherent deficiency, but because you simply just need to apply more work? You know, the worst thing would be for all of us intelligent people to gather in this room saturate with two days of terrific information and then not do anything about it, rendering an awesome conference into you know, what is effectively a food truck hangout. And so I want to encourage you guys to really take this information, because the encouraging thing is that the results and experiences from Dweck's research show that just becoming aware of the difference between the fixed mindset and the growth mindset can educate and transform the way that you make decisions. And I believe that this is something that will create a lot of business value for you and your organizations moving forward. So that's, uh, let's take action, people, all right? That's all I have. Uh, There's further reading right here. Uh, Julia Evans' blog post, so you want to be a wizard. Uh, Carol Dweck's research. The book, Mindset, that's just what it's called. And Allison Kaptur, she has a great blog post uh, for technical individuals about effective learning strategies for programmers. So, and, uh, and if you want to reach out to me, my DMs are open on Twitter. That's my, uh, my GitHub repo. So thank you very much.